Welcome to the Lessons from the Great Coaches podcast. I've learned that you don't do it alone. You learn so many different things from so many different coaches. That's an elite learning environment. Failure is not a problem. How you deal with it is a problem. How to be resilient. How important it is to infuse joy in the process of learning. To be a good coach, you've got to give more than you take. What an interesting life it is to be a leader. Hello and welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast, where we believe that there is no algorithm for leadership, and so we interview great sports coaches from around the world to try and find ideas to help us all be better leaders, no matter whether we're leading sports teams, community groups, or corporate teams. As the podcast has grown, the great coaches we have interviewed have shared so much insight and wisdom that we decided to create episodes dedicated entirely to the ideas that have resonated with us the most. Today's episode focuses on the topic of leadership traits. And just before we go to the interview, today's podcast is brought to you by the Macquarie University Business School's MBA program. Designed to empower, challenge and transform, the Macquarie MBA gives you the business skills and knowledge you need to succeed in an evolving global economy. The program bridges the gap between theory and real-world application, bringing together world-leading professors, executives, and industry partners to teach you how business can be used for good. I have just started working with the team at Macquarie on some projects and can attest to the quality of the people and material. To find out more, search for Macquarie University Business School's MBA. And now, please enjoy our episode on leadership traits. You're listening to the Lessons from the Great Coaches podcast. In late 2022, we returned home to Australia as a family after living as expats in Europe and Asia for the prior 16 years. It was an exciting time for all of us as we started up our new life. One of the things I enjoyed most about being home was meeting new people and making new friends and connections. Around this time, I interviewed the iconic rowing coach, Noel Donaldson. Noel has coached teams from Australia and New Zealand to Olympic gold and was terrific to interview. Afterwards, he suggested I contact Bill Daverone, who led the Australian Institute of Sport coach development team, as he was sure I'd find a lot in common with him. I went on to meet Bill, and Bill challenged me with an interesting idea. He invited me to come along to speak to some of the Australian coaches in his Gen 32 program about what I've learned from the 200 plus great coaches we've interviewed on the podcast. I accepted and then set about trying to condense down what I actually have learned from all of those interviews. The one thing I knew was that there was no algorithm for leadership, but after reviewing the transcripts of all of those interviews, I felt I could identify the leadership traits of the great coaches and group them into four key areas. In today's podcast, I will introduce you to the traits we have identified using audio from the great coaches themselves. We have also created a diagnostic that uses 20 questions to allow you to compare your leadership style to that of the great coaches. It's free, anonymous, only takes a few minutes and should help you identify areas of relative strength and weakness in your own leadership style, regardless of whether you're leading a sporting or a non-sporting team. The link to that diagnostic is in the show notes. And now, please enjoy our podcast on leadership traits. The first group of leadership traits is people. The great coaches have care at the very centre of their approach. In fact, some of them describe their role as being a caring profession. Many of them quote the famous line attributed to the American president, Theodore Roosevelt. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. They talk about care lifting engagement and therefore, as a result, the commitment that people give. This is something I have definitely found as well. Here is the English Premier League coach, Thomas Frank, talking about the importance of love and care. I think 
of course love is a is a big word uh, and and a love to your children or your or your partner uh, is is different compared to love to your friends or or your players or your or your colleagues um uh because we all know that, the, that there need to be a lot of demands and there need to be some consequence but i really really believe you need to build that relationship with with trust or love or what what you call it you need to i think it's so important that you need to show you, you care about them um, every single one of them and i think that's the the most difficult um for me as a as a head coach that that they I really hope that that they 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 feel and they see me as a person that they care about all of them, but I also completely understand um, the way the the, the football work uh, in terms of I have twenty three players. I'm only starting eleven of them, so the rest of them they don't get as much uh, love or attention uh, because that's just the way it is. I really try to get around all of them. I, of course, I speak to all of them every day. But you know that more in depth con- conversation. You can't have that with 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 all of them uh, the whole time. I try to do it um, because I care of all of them uh, about all of them. I really want all of them to be as good as possible um, and achieve big things. But unfortunately, I can only I can only play eleven of them. Despite having care at the centre of their approach, though, they do see their main task as challenging people to help them be the best they can be. And in doing this, there's a line that you constantly have to find and re-find as a leader. Too much challenge, and it crosses over into what people can view as bullying, but not enough, and you're abdicating your responsibility. Here is the iconic Australian coach, Rick Charlesworth, talking about challenging people. And I think that, uh, you know, that's, uh, as a coach, you uh, you do all of that, but what you do is you stretch the people who are working with you. You challenge them and you take them to a place they didn't think they could be. To begin the process of challenging people, many of the great coaches we interview talk about meeting people where they are, not from the perspective of the organisation's goals or their own agenda. When I heard this idea first mentioned, I didn't understand at all what it meant. But as I dug deeper, I found that it was a way of engaging with people from a position of care and authenticity. Before learning this, I would meet with people who worked for me once a month for an hour and we would run through agenda points that we both wanted to discuss. But after hearing the great coaches talk about this, I moved to one hour every week and we started from the other person's agenda. And in those sessions, I tried my best to ask questions and resist the urge to relay stories or give direction. And when I asked questions, I tried to make sure that they helped the other person more than they helped me. Here is the American basketball coach, Jenny Busek, talking about the idea of meeting people where they are. And you can't really influence somebody um, until you meet them where they are and then lead them from that point. You can't just get frustrated that they're not where you want them to be. You got to figure out where they are, why they are there, connect with them at that point, and then build up some equity to, to influence. In summary, the five main leadership traits that we have identified when it comes to people are, one, caring about people in their team beyond their ability to deliver a skill or play their role. Two, challenging people to create development plans and then regularly discussing them with the person. Three, using questions to help people become more aware and find their own solutions. Four, the confidence to discuss the individual beliefs of the people they lead. And five, helping people reframe their thoughts. The second group of leadership traits is culture. Great coaches have the team's culture at the top of their priority list. They talk about the culture as the environment that surrounds the team. And this environment is shaped by what you are willing to walk past, not just as a leader, but as a group of individuals. In the best environments, the tension in the team's behaviours and standards is discussed and addressed regularly. Here is the volleyball coach, Alan Knight, talking about 
the importance of culture. I think that's what's changed my leadership the most is um, putting culture at the top of my list of my programs that I coach. And it doesn't mean that X's and O's and blocking and serving, all that's not super important. It just means we have to constantly spend time um, maintaining, building our culture. And if it's good, water the green spots and work on the brown spots. The team environment is united under a vision. And when this vision is realistic and something that people buy into, it's the starting point for shaping a culture. Then there are agreed characteristics. These might be behaviours or words the team wants to be known for. These characteristics are informed by the team's values, which are co-created with the people in the organisation or club. Sean Deitch coaches in the English Premier League, and here he reflects on this. So culture and environment get thrown around in sport all the time and in business, I'm sure. And people just think you just flick a switch and it just happens and everyone aligns. It doesn't work like that. You know, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes commitment to keep reinforcing the key values that you want to make that kind of culture and to make that mindset and that that environment and, and align, you know, a simple saying, but all knows this point in the right direction. The trick the great coaches often talk about is taking the culture, the values, the words from the poster on the wall to the interactions with each other out on the pitch and in the locker room. And one of the best examples we found of this came from American football coach Jeff Trailer. What's interesting in Jeff's example is the amount of time and energy that goes into discussing the culture at the start of each season. It's something that I've reflected on a lot, and I believe it's something that could add a lot of value to non-sporting teams. Well, they'll be back Tuesday in our first team meeting, our first culture pillars integrity. So I will walk in the meeting. Everybody will sit up with their notes out. I will say the word integrity and they'll scream back to me all at once. Win the day. That's really our main culture pillars to win the day. This would be the best we can be every day. So then I'm going to do a 10 to 15 minute presentation on what integrity means to me. Uh, we'll break up from that team meeting. Our special teams coordinator will speak on integrity. We'll break up into offense and defense. The offense and defense coordinator will speak on integrity. Uh, then we'll break into players position meetings and there'll be a player from each group speak on integrity. Then at the end of practice, another player will speak on integrity. We do that every day, the whole week. So then the next week we go to passion. So that's the second culture pillar. So I'll walk in the team room. I'll say passion. They'll scream back when the day and uh, I'll teach on passion for 10 or 15 minutes. And then not to bore you, but we'll follow that exact same plan on passion We work our way through every culture pillar. The five main leadership traits that we've found that connect to culture are one, a vision for the team that people are united in pursuing. Two, the creation of an environment that is consistent with the vision. Three, the facilitation of a team-created set of values and behaviours. Four, the ability to role model the behaviours that are consistent with the team's values And five, the organisation of regular reviews, where the team discusses their culture and identifies areas of strength and required improvement. The third group of leadership traits is learning. The first question on every interview with a great coach is a version of, what does our guest think the great coaches they have experienced do differently that sets them apart? Many of their answers reference the ability to learn. Here is an example from the volleyball coach, Doug Beal. I think the great coaches are eager to learn. They aren't just lifelong learners. I think that's, a, that's an easy answer. They're eager to learn. Uh, they reach out to peers and, uh, and other people that they find information about or that somebody introduces them to. And they, they have developed a network that is... Uh, important to them as people and and it's much more than just how do these individuals help me be better solving a problem or relating to a group or knowing myself it's how do they make me 
a better person? How do they make me um, more aware of my failings, my limitations, and my strengths? And, um, and I think they become a big part of that. Great coaches can identify the importance of learning as a precursor to innovation. They talk about the goal of learning at a rate that is faster than the change that is happening around them. And I think at times this desire to learn becomes obsessive and adjusting to deal with that obsession and the life balance challenges that come with their role is also something they regularly talk about. Here is the athletic coach, Frank Dick, talking about these issues. But that was a big lesson to me, a, a willingness um, to, to you, you, you've got to want to learn faster and, and to, to learn better. And it, it's not just that you want that in your, your, your players, you've actually got to be pretty hot at that your, yourself. And when it comes to uh, the, 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 the lessons that you have to learn, I think it's very important at the back of your mind to understand there are only three things you really have to know, Paul. One, you've got to know what you know. Two, you've got to know what you don't know. And three, you've got to know somebody who does and get them into the team because you can't know everything. You must never make an athlete the victim of your limitations. That's really, really important. And limitations, we all have. We all have them. But put your hand up very quickly when you know you've reached the end of something. So I think there's this, this awareness of learning faster than the opposition. You've got to know what it is you can learn. And also, you, you've got to know that point where you can't learn fast enough to look after that person who's in front of you. Great coaches describe being uncomfortable about being comfortable and being open to new ideas and having firm views held lightly. Curiosity drives their learning and they try and capture this in development plans for themselves and importantly also for the teams they're leading. Here is the basketball coach Pokey Chapman talking about development plans. There's one, there's a commitment to the individual development of every person slash player slash staff in your organization. And what happens, we have these pockets of commitment to player development. We have these pockets of commitment to sending a staff off to a seminar to get better. That needs to be second nature and in your DNA. That needs to be a formula for getting better because we abandon them, then we come back to them when we need them. And I think, uh, you know, specifically about a basketball team, it's so, so simple. We committed just 20 minutes every day to the individual, truly individual development of each player. And what that means is some player might need video. Some players might need conversation. Some players might need reps. And I think if you take the time and energy to figure out exactly what those people need and then extend that to everyone in the organization, you can't help but improve. <laughs> you give yourself the best chance. So I think it's that commitment to that development of not just the people on the court, but the people around them. Uh, I think it's just a recipe for something really, really good. In summary, the five main leadership traits we've found when it comes to learning are one, facilitating team learning so that the group is able to innovate faster than the change happening around them. Two, balancing the curiosity of being open to new ideas with the commitment to existing processes. Three, possessing a personal development plan, which is regularly reviewed and updated. Four, self-reflection routines to distill learning and then move forward without unnecessary rumination. And five, the ability to reflect on their performance and how it might have impacted the situation before providing feedback to other people. The fourth group of leadership traits is performance. The great coaches are focused on their performance as a leader, and understand the impact it can have on the team. Their focus on performance starts with the creation of what they often call their coaching philosophy. Their philosophy starts with their purpose, which is the reason they have chosen to take on a coaching role. It's then underpinned by the focus areas to help them achieve their purpose. For example, development, mindset and preparation. 
And within each of these areas are truths they fall back on to help guide their decision making. An example of this might be within mindset, where a coach believes an open mindset allows you to develop new skills at a faster rate. Here is an example of a coaching philosophy from the golf coach, Steve Ban. Philosophy, I, I would pride myself on saying that I'm holistic, being that golf is made up of technical, physical, mental, tactical and life skills outside of all of that. So there's the big, there's the big five. And, uh, and I, I, I've never tried to lock myself into being a method coach where this is the method that I coach and everyone has to fit and, and swing it the same way. Uh, so I, I'm always trying to identify with the players I've worked with over the years what areas of their game that they can create a point of difference or separation from the rest of the field. Or otherwise, you're just playing like everyone else and hoping to have a good week every now and then. This philosophy helps them when they are challenged ethically or competitively and will be a touchstone they use to help with decision making. This is important if you are going to try to treat people fairly and as individuals and not just apply blanket rules. Here is the Australian rules football coach Neil Craig emphasising this point. Um, And so the scrutiny of the job uh, and the results. So... You know, it's all of a sudden, I mean, you work for a, a big, big company, but I don't get to read about your performance on the back page of the Times, you know, whereas I do about Eddie Jones. And so it adds another layer to your capacity to, um, you know, to better perform your role and to be clear thinking because there's, um, there's a justification. You have to justify it. Uh, about why you do things. And sometimes that's, you know, the role of the media, you know, is uh, is really interesting. It's d- diverting from your, your question a bit, but in, in a lot of ways, the media keeps you accountable because they'll ask the question, well, why did you do that? Or why is your team not performing? Or why is uh, this individual player being allowed to do what he's doing? And... This is where, unless you know yourself as a coach and, you know, the common term now being, you know, unless you have a, a really clear philosophy about a range of things, um, you'll get caught out really quickly. You'll become, you'll be, you'll be seen as very wishy-washy because you haven't thought things through. The great coaches we talk to improve their own performance by having self-reflection routines. For example, many of them talk about journaling or using mentors. These routines help them capture learning and then move on and avoid ruminating, which can take you away from focusing on the next most important thing. Here is the New Zealand netball coach, Helene Wilson, talking about this. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, you've got to self-reflect as a coach. So that's a skill. And if you don't have a process for self-reflecting, then you're not going to grow your awareness around um, what you're doing as a coach or could you be doing things better. But you've got to be careful that self-reflection isn't ruminating, so you're not just sitting on things and overthinking things because that's not healthy either. So I always think to myself, um, what have I done in practice today? Why have I done it? What's working? What's not? And so I have a process where I'm going over those things and what, what have I noticed which is a really powerful question, to, and what could I do differently? Um, when I think about those questions and when you you reflect in that way, it might pose some more questions to you, but they're questions that you can put to your group or the people that are around you, and then you can lever it off, off the support and expertise you have to be better. If you're having a critical conversation or a difficult conversation with someone else rather than yourself, I've always thought, what's the stance that I need to take? So you can take a stance of advocating what you need to discuss in in an honest or critical conversation, but you can also take the stance of inquiry and inquiring with questions, and questions are a great way to get people um, on the same level as you. So depending on what the outcome of what you're reflecting on yourself, what your contribution was to the situation, and then how you need to engage with someone else, you need to be really careful about the stance that you take to, um, yeah, just bring that critical conversation and honest conversation to the forefront. 
in summary, the main leadership traits we have found that connect to the coach's performance are, one, a written leadership philosophy that helps guide their decision making. Two, an understanding of the values that drive them as a leader and where they overlap or diverge from the teams. And three, mentors that help them reflect on their performance and find ways to improve. You're listening to the Lessons from the Great Coaches podcast. We hope you enjoyed our episode on leadership traits and found one or two things that you can use to try and improve your own leadership style. As we said at the start, the link to the diagnostic that helps you compare your leadership styles to that of the great coaches is in the show notes. The survey is free, anonymous, and only takes a few minutes to complete. And as always, please let us know if you have any feedback, just like Scott Schweckel, who after listening to our podcast with Sir Graham Henry said, a great podcast makes so much sense. Thanks, Scott. We love the interaction with the people around the world. It actually keeps us going on the podcast. And so if you have any comments, ideas, or thoughts on how we can improve, please drop us a note. All the details on how to do that are in the show notes or on our website, thegreatcoachespodcast.com.